Hello and welcome to Zoo Nation TV, Episode 3. We've got a whole bunch of zoo news coming your way this week. I'm your host, wildlife expert, conservation enthusiast, and all-around zoo supporter, Clay Carbajal. Today, we have stories from the Texas State Aquarium, the Maryland Zoo, the Riverbank Zoo, SeaWorld San Antonio, the Shedd Aquarium, the Columbus Zoo, and many others. But first, we've got to take you live. Well, not really. They've already been live for weeks and weeks and weeks. Stop the presses. Everyone has to know that April the Giraffe, finally, after weeks of anticipation, gave birth to a beautiful male calf. Uh, now, the Animal Adventure Park had live streaming video for weeks of, in anticipation of April's upcoming birth. Now, giraffe's gestation is around 15 months, so they were waiting for this calf a while. When calves are born, they stand around 6 feet tall, and they're born anywhere from 150 to 200 pounds. Now, this video you're watching right now has over 14 million views. Hats off to the Animal Adventure Park for connecting that many people to a little bit of behind the scenes of what happens caring for large hoofstock like giraffes. Now, little giraffes will learn to walk within a couple of hours, but in the wild, only about 25% of any giraffe calf will make it to adulthood. That's because lions, leopards, and hyenas can pick off a calf pretty easily. Now, a naming contest is in place. Uh, you can go to NameAprilsCalf.com. It's $1 per vote, and a minimum of five votes is needed uh, for you to cast your vote. So $5 will get you your name in the hat. They're going to split the proceeds among the Giraffe Conservation, Ava's Little Heroes, which is an amazing organization. This is a charity for children with medical issues. And proceeds will also go to benefit the zoo themselves. So good job, Animal Adventure Park. Thanks for keeping us updated week after week. Even when people were like, this is an April Fool's hoax, the proof is out there. Congratulations, April the Giraffe and all the staff at the Animal Adventure Park on your brand new six foot tall, 150, 200 pound giraffe calf. Now our next zoo born this week comes to us from the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, home of Jungle Jack Hanna and an amazing staff. And now home to three new polar bear cubs. Look at this. At the zoo, they had twins born. You had Aurora and Anana. Now, they were both twins. Now, both of these polar bears have since given birth. The Columbus Zoo, uh, they gave birth uh, in November of 2016. Uh, Aurora gave birth to twins, one boy and one girl, and Anana had one girl. All the cubs have been living with their mothers off viewing in dens during the wintertime. Now, get this. A polar bear gestation is about eight months. Females will gain over 400 pounds during pregnancy. Ladies out there, I know you know what it feels like to gain weight during pregnancy, but can you imagine 400 pounds and one to two cubs inside of you? Now, females will give birth once every two to three years or so, and cubs are born right around one pound each. Very small, so they stay huddled in that den. Mom keeps them warm, keeps them safe from the outside elements, of course, nurses them. Uh, mothers care for their young for about 30 months. Now, Anana and her cub made their debut on Wednesday of last week. Aurora and her cubs uh, made their debut on Thursday of last week. Now, a naming contest is already in place for Anana's cat, uh, cub, and the name choices are Amelia Gray, because she has a gray patch on the side of her neck, Denali, uh, Ellipsy, and Vita. So make sure you go and vote for your favorite names uh, at the Columbus Zoo's website. You can find them on social media. And of course, you can just find the Columbus Zoo altogether. And our last Zoo Born of the Week is another one that's been long awaited. At SeaWorld San Antonio, Takara, a female killer whale, gave birth to a calf. Killer whale gestation is around 17 months. So the team at SeaWorld San Antonio had been waiting quite a long time. But don't take it from me. Let's listen to one of their trainers and get an up-close look at the actual birth of this killer whale. Take he just 
had a calf and it was the most amazing thing ever and it is a moment that I won't soon forget. In the next minutes, hours, days, uh, we will look for the calf to grow stronger and stronger uh, in their swimming ability and we will also look for mom to help the calf learn to nurse and they nurse strong and uh, it's just an amazing bond that Takara has. It's still early and there are a lot of important landmarks that the calf has to get through. It looks great. It's even moving away, looking along the mom's body, swimming off a little bit on its own. Uh, respirations are strong and healthy. Everything we look for is doing well at this point. To see this calf being born, this is life changing and a moment that I will never forget. What an awesome video. Congratulations SeaWorld San Antonio on the birth of this historic killer whale calf. Hats off to all the animal care team, and especially hats off to you, Takara. Now the work's not over. That baby still has years and years to mature, and that yellowish tint will fade to that beautiful white and black coloration. Researchers will learn more and more about how babies mature, and for the first time, really, they'll be able to interact with multiple siblings. Researchers in San Antonio, for the first time, will be able to see how a calf develops around multiple siblings of the same mother. And really cool research they're going to be doing at SeaWorld San Antonio. This is awesome news. Congratulations to all of you. And that is all for our Zooborns for this week. Now, for our coming Zoom segment, a segment that highlights new attractions at facilities around the country, we go right down the road from SeaWorld San Antonio, down Interstate 37 to Corpus Christi, Texas, and the Texas State Aquarium, where they're opening a brand new exhibit called the Caribbean Journey. Now, this is an all new realm. It's a major new pavilion and it's been 30 years in the making. Now guests will embark on a journey from a Mayan jungle out to the Gulf. Now major exhibits will include Morlet's crocodiles. I've never even seen one of these. It's going to be incredible. Uh, flamingos will greet you as you walk by. There's going to be vampire bats. The very, very popular slow moving sloths. There's going to be a living coral reef. Now, once you walk around this, this exhibit, you'll be able to actually go into this almost like an overlook. And there'll be a brand new events area where people are going to have special events, of course, generate revenue for the, uh, for the aquarium. And then you'll go down an elevator, and you can see right here a brand new exhibit uh, featuring sharks in a shipwreck themed area. There's coral reef exhibits, which will feature glass domes that guests can enter. The shark exhibit, it's really cool because it's above and below water viewing. And in the future, they may even offer scuba diving opportunities. This pavilion will more than double the aquarium's indoor space. This is a huge, huge addition for the city of Corpus Christi, Texas. Awesome. Uh, other features will include a 4D theater featuring shark, a 4D experience. And again, that special event area is available for rentals. And if you cannot wait to see the Caribbean journey, you won't have to much longer. May 13th, 2017, go visit the Texas State Aquarium. It's a great facility, some great people that work there, and now they have an amazing a new addition to be proud of. Hats off to you, Texas State Aquarium. Now that moves us in to this week's Awe or Awful. But this week, I'd like to add a third category. Awe, Awful, or Amazing. This week's theme is bears. Now here in the United States, we have the black bear, the grizzly bear that we can encounter in certain parts of the country. Well, some people have. Let's take a look at our first clip in this week's Awe or Awful. So as you can see here, a bear is just gingerly walking down the streets of a California neighborhood. Helicopters above. I would say this is kind of awful. Not because the bear is doing anything wrong but because we've urbanized habitat so much the animals are having to walk into our neck of the woods to look for food. Now, you're going to see right here a reason why you shouldn't Pokemon and not look up. Oh gosh, there's a bear. Run away. That guy probably feels pretty awful too. Our next clip comes to us from a gorgeous national park where a very large grizzly bear has come upon a guy who just to, seems to be sitting at the riverside. Look at that jaw. Grizzly bears like this can run 35 miles an hour. They chase down large prey such as elk, moose, deer. But typically these omnivores are chewing on berries or grazing in the meadows. Now this incredible omnivore 
makes the very first amazing moment. It's also pretty dangerous. And if at any time this bear wanted to, well, make his new friend here uh, have a bad day, he could very easily. You see the bear just sitting down, getting comfy. That's awesome. Amazing way to experience wildlife. But I got to give my hat off to the gentleman recording this video. He didn't panic. He didn't run away. He didn't trigger any kind of aggression from this bear. He stood his ground. And right here, you'll see the bear get up, start walking towards the guy. He makes a noise. Hey, don't mess with me, buddy. The bear walks off. It's exactly what you should do if approached by these kind of animals. And always carry bear spray if you're hiking our natural wonders. <laughs> Last segment is an awe moment at a zoo in South Carolina as a young lady seems to be playing peekaboo with a large grizzly bear. Now, zoos are an amazing way for young people to connect with wildlife found in their very backyard. My hope is this young lady left that South Carolina zoo with a greater respect and understanding for bears and a wanting to protect them. That was an awe moment. It makes me think of my daughter experiencing our local zoos and the wildlife she can connect with uh, at the comfort of a local zoo. And hopefully the conservation, it'll inspire her to want to take part in. Now that moves us on to our, really, segment of the week. Speaking of zoos, we have to go all the way to California for this week's really. And I'm giving a big really to City Councilman Paul Quartz in Los Angeles. Now, this councilman has proposed to move Billy, an Asian elephant male, out of his exhibit to a sanctuary. Now, this exhibit that Billy is currently living in is uh, opened in 2010, costs $42 million, and is over six acres. It's home to Billy and two female elephants. Now, Billy has lived at this zoo since 1989. What's the councilman's problem with this zoo? Well, he says there's not enough space for Billy to get exercise. However, studies have shown that they, they put these trackers on the elephant's ankles, and they've shown that zoo elephants travel just as much as their wild counterparts. Of course, they don't have to be trudging through the jungle to find food or escape a, a rancher that's upset with them getting into their fields. They have the food provided to them in a loving, caring environment. Now, this exhibit that Billy lives in at the zoo includes trails, deep pools for these animals to get into, and waterfalls for enrichment. One of the big claims that Councilman has is that the zoo does not provide enough psychological enrichment for the animals. Really? That's what zoos are all about. Creating toys, sessions, enriching environments. Uh, these animals have just as much enrichment in a zoo as they would in the wild. The difference is they don't have to defend themselves from predators fight off pollution or deforestation. They don't have to forage for food all day long. They have it provided for them. This councilman suggests that elephants should be sent to a sanctuary and not live in zoos. Now the zoo obviously highly disagrees with this and is hosting an open house for the media to come see the facilities themselves. Really? Councilman, I hope you go to the LA Zoo with the media and see for yourself the loving, caring environment the LA Zoo is providing for Billy a big tusker of an elephant at the LA Zoo. That brings us to our conservation highlights of the week. And this week we have two really good ones. We're gonna be talking about the Vaquita CPR program that we started in episode one, but had some technical difficulties. But first we start at the Shed Aquarium in Chicago, where they've started a straw initiative for Earth Day. You know what, let's let the people in the shed tell you the impact that plastics are having around our natural world. My name is Jacqueline. I'm the manager of Conservation Partnerships and Program here at Shedd Aquarium. One of the biggest threats to our rivers, lakes, and oceans today is plastic pollution. We find a lot of single-use plastics in the water, and this is a big threat to animals. They can accidentally become entangled in it. They can swallow it or eat it. And if an animal eats plastic, it can make their stomach feel full. So they actually stop eating and they can starve to death that way. So single-use plastics are things like soda bottles, water bottles, plastic packaging, things that are only used one time and then tossed out. But when we throw it away, where does it go? It ends up in a landfill or it may end up in the environment or in the water, lakes, rivers. Um, and those single-use plastics can be a detriment to animals. 
Since plastic never actually biodegrades, it remains in the environment for hundreds of years as toxic microparticles and can be consumed by animals at all levels of the food web. 80% of plastic that ends up in water, whether it's in the rivers, lakes, or oceans, comes from the land and is carried into our water systems and can really accumulate there. And so in the oceans, we can end up with these huge masses of, of plastics. The most well-known is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is thought to be even larger than the state of Texas. However, it's difficult to estimate the size since it's a huge area and the marine debris is constantly moving with ocean currents. This is also why it's so challenging to remove the pieces of garbage from the ocean. Plastic pollution can be a bummer for both people and for animals. About 500 million straws are used here in America every day. Uh, we also have eliminated plastic lids and plastic bags in our cafe and our gift shop. We also are doing more and more recycling and more composting. We're really trying to keep as much waste as possible away from the landfill. One little change can have a big impact for animals and the waterways that you love. Shed single-use plastics and take a big step toward a cleaner world. Great job, Shed Aquarium. I hope that your Earth Day initiative really has an impact on the local environments there in Illinois and around the world. Something I thought that was extremely interesting by doing some research about this story, 500 million straws a day we use here on planet Earth. Which means, because of plastic's durability, every straw that's ever been manufactured or created still exists on Earth. They have not biodegraded. That's incredible, incredible facts. My hat's off to you at the Shed Aquarium. I hope you are able to inspire many people in Chicago and around the world on reducing our single-use plastics and moving to more sustainable uh, options. Now, our next conservation story is a redo from episode one where we had some technical difficulties. This story concerns the most rare and one of the tiniest cetaceans you're going to see on planet Earth, or you might not. It's the vaquita. And for this conservation story, we go to Mexico, where the vaquita has some very, very stiff challenges ahead of it, including being bycatch in fishermen nets. And why are these fishermen so heavily netting that environment? They're looking for a fish called a totoaba. The Chinese have a very high demand on this animal's swim bladder. Now, there are less than 30 vaquita remaining anywhere on planet Earth. And by anywhere, that little area that was highlighted at the beginning of this video, that's only places they live. Now, a conservation partnership with the Mexican government has been reached for the Vaquita CPR program. CPR stands for Conservation, Protection, and Recovery. Over 100 members of the association and zoos and aquariums are in collaboration. And they're willing to pledge $3 million. Now, where we are right now, that we've already pledged over $1 million from the AZA. This makes it the AZA the largest supporter of Akita conservation besides the Mexican government. Now, that's incredible. The AZA, they have no vaquitas anywhere on display. That's why zoos are so important. They take their research and, they, and their resources and they go out and help species that are in need. Now, this project is part of the AZA's SAFE initiative. SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. Now, the donor list of AZA includes SeaWorld, who we talked about earlier. They've donated over $100,000. Uh, in the over $50,000 category, the Brookfield Zoo, the Shedd Aquarium, who we just talked about, uh, the Phoenix Zoo, the Texas State Aquarium, who was in this, and Africam Safari Park. Now, other organizations, other AZA facilities are taking part. If you want a list of what AZA facility is donating to this Safe Vaquita Rescue Project, you can go to their website, www.aza.org slash donors, and you can see who's giving money to this project. Now, IMATA has raised $17,000 with a gra grassroots GoFundMe campaign. Uh, the AMMPA, their members, SeaWorld, the, the Chicago Zoological Society, Van Aqua, they've pledged veterinary and scientific support to help this project. Efforts to save the vaquita echo those from the 1980s, which helped to save the California condor. This animal is incredible, folks. It's a gorgeous creature. Not many of you have ever even seen this animal. I've never seen one ever in the wild. 
but I'm inspired to help their conservation, and you should be too. These animals could go the way of the dodo. They could go extinct because of, uh, because of us, because of overfishing, because of pollution. These animals are getting caught in nets. They're being pulled ashore. They're in a bad situation. With the Mexican government behind us, the people of Mexico starting to be educated, and the association of zoos and aquariums getting uh, really involved in the conservation of the species, it might be just enough to help. Or they're too far gone. And we've got to prevent the next species from going down this route. So hats off to the AZA, hats off to the Mexican government, hats off to all the folks involved in trying to protect less than 30 vaquitas remaining. It's incredible. Incredible and extremely, extremely sad. Now as the vaquita looks for a second chance of survival, there are plenty of zoos around the world giving second chances to rescued wildlife. And for our first ever second chances segment, we take you to the Maryland Zoo where they just rescued these guys, two grizzly bear cubs. Uh, now these animals were rescued in Montana where they were orphaned. The cubs were found on tribal lands where they were observed for several weeks and no mother was found tending to them. They began to struggle for survival. So they were captured, examined by veterinarians. The smaller of the cubs was already shot. The mother was later found alive but with severe shotgun wounds to her face. She had to be humanely euthanized. She couldn't find food for herself and it wasn't repairable. The cubs were six months old at the time of capture. They didn't have any necessary survival skills because typically they would stay with mom two to three years learning how to be grizzly bears. So they were sent to a temporary rehab facility in Montana. And when they, when they were there, they realized they couldn't be released. You know, any rehab facility rescues, rehabilitates, and releases. But sometimes release is an option. So this rehab put out a call to the AZA to find them a home. And the Maryland Zoo had experience in caring for most other bear species, but never grizzlies. It's a big first step for the Maryland Zoo. The bears moved into the polar bear watch area, which has three yards. Two are visible by the public. The area is also home to one female polar bear, and they swap their exhibits so they can change and add enrichment. Now, a naming contest has gotten over 6,000 votes, and they have chosen the names Nova and Nita. Congratulations, Maryland Zoo, on your giving second chances to some grizzly bear cubs. You know, grizzly bears once ranged all over the United States because of deforestation, overhunting, and just fear by the public. Their populations have dwindled to small pockets. Good for you, Maryland Zoo, being able to educate a whole new generation uh, of your locals about grizzly bears. Folks, that wraps up Zoo Nation TV for this week. If you have any comments about stories or stories you'd like to see in the future, leave them right here in the comments below. Thank you for liking our Zoo Nation page. Share our page, share our video, find us on Twitter, Find us on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, at Clay Carbohol. Let us know what you like about Zoo Nation TV and what you don't, what you'd like to see in the future, and what you'd like to see us get rid of. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode. Go visit your local zoo and aquarium, and don't forget, conservation rules!